Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for those introduction. Thank you everyone for being here through the rain and the traffic. Um, and this is, this is indeed my first uh, event around the book anywhere in the world. This is the first event at all. And I'm excited and a little bit nervous because uh, so it just it just came out about two months ago, but it went out of my hands about a year ago when it went off to copy editors and so forth. And I've tried very hard to forget it for the last year. So it's, I've had to spend this morning trying to remember what my book's about and come up with about a half an hour where I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, so I'm going to take as I'm going to try and do it in as short a time as I can, just introduce you to this audience of the book. So I, I'm looking forward to Dr. Samia Khatun's um, stinging critique of it, which will be following this. Um, and I just want to take about 20 minutes maybe to lay out what the book is about to introduce this audience to the book. Um, so let me be, just begin. Jute fibers used to connect the Bengal peasantry in this region to a global marketplace. It entangled them in global circuits of commodities and capital and it subjected them to the rhythms and vicissitudes of global commodity prices. The primary question posed my, by my book is this, what happened to this mostly Muslim pe Bengali peasant community once their lives became so thoroughly enmeshed in global capital? What happens to a group of people when their entire existence, when their well-being, when their survival, when their prosperity is a function, is dependent on terms of trade, exchanges of prices set in very distant places. So I examined this question of how entanglements in global capital reshaped the material and intellectual lives of jute cultivating peasantry over 100 years, beginning in the mid 19th century when jute first became a global commodity and ending in the mid 20th century in the immediate aftermath of partition and Pakistan. So at one, on one hand, this book is really sort of an attempt to tell the history of this region um, of Bangladesh through fiber through the fiber jute. But, and I think this is important, I wanted, the book is also an attempt to retell the history of global capital, not just the history of this region, but the history of the world. Um, this, because this is what happened with jute in this region is really part of a very, very large story that involves not just Bengal, but also West Africa, other parts of South Asia, Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and so forth. It is about the making of global capitalism during the 19th and 20th centuries, when under the twinned impetus of European empire and European capital, peasant communities in Europe's colonies in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean produced ever increasing quantities of cotton, sugar, cocoa, peanuts, palm oil, hemp, rubber, and rice to feed and fuel European industry. Just a few statistics to drive the point home. Between 1850 and 1910, the number of acres of land planted with jute in Bengal increased from 50,000 to just under 4 million, an 80-fold increase. In that same period, Senegalese peanut production increased from just 5 metric tons to 95,000 metric tons. Ghanaian cocoa production increased from 95 pounds to about 100,000 tons. Manila hemp production in the Philippines went from 18,000 to 160,000 tons. The acreage of Burmese rice increased from 700,000 to 5 million acres. And peasants in Malaya planted about a million acres of rubber trees. Global capital was made by peasants. Global capital was made by peasants in colonized regions of Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. And I think this is something we often forget. Historians of global capital tend to see peasant production as essentially pre-capitalist as remnants of a feudal system destined to disappear with the inexorable advance of capitalism. So my book, rather, at its broadest level, is an attempt to reinsert the peasantry into histories of capital and to narrate the history of global capital from the perspective of the peasantry, particularly in colonized regions. So I want to take maybe, I'll try and do it as quickly as I can, just sort of give you a brief, broad outline of the time period and sort of the major arguments that are made in the book. Um, let me begin by talking about the economics of jute cultivation. The expansion of jute cultivation in the 19th century was not spurred, say unlike indigo in this very same region, by violence. It wasn't, the colonial state didn't come in and force people to start growing jute, nor did they actually come in and start encourage people to start growing jute. 
It was a function of prices set in distant markets. If you look at the expansion of jute over those 50 years, it took place in spurts. Every time prices went up in Europe, acreage would increase rather sharply. Firstly, in the 1860s, a very rapid increase in acreage, then in the 1880s, and then in the 1900s. And jute cultivation reached its historic high in about 1909 during a boom in jute prices. The expansion of jute, however, came at the expense of rice. Fiber and grain competed for peasant land and labor. To grow jute was to forego the production of rice. But this was okay as long as most farmers in the Bengal Delta had enough land to grow rice for household subsistence and then jute for commercial sale. But the expansion in 1900 would change things rather dramatically. At that point, during that period, farmers stopped growing enough rice to feed their households. Rather, they would grow jute and buy rice from the profits they made from, from the sales. They would make up the shortfall in subsistence from, that, um, from, from their proceeds of their jute sales. And that led to expose them to hunger. This was OK as long as the terms of trade between jute and rice were good, as long as you could the price of jute was high enough for you to be able to buy enough rice. But it meant when jute prices fell, as they always do, we're talking about global capital, boom and bust, prices going up, prices collapsing. But when they fell, they exposed peasants to hunger. And 1914, when jute prices fell rather abruptly, so 1914, the war breaks out in August 1914. And this is just as farmers are bringing jute into the market. The jute market disappears. And this is the first instance this, is, this, to me, in my thesis, in my book, is the beginning of peasant impoverishment in the Bengal Delta. This is the moment when, from then onwards, we see a steady slide into rap, into immiseration, a steady process of immiseration, a steady slide into deep poverty. Poverty was driven by many things. It was driven by unfavorable terms of trade between jute and consumer goods. It was driven by fragmenting smaller and smaller land holdings. It was driven by a deteriorating ecology, which meant more frequent and more severe floods and, water, and more uh, waterborne diseases. It was exacerbated by indebtedness. More and more peasants took on emergency loans to tide them over to overcome periods of extreme risk, extreme uh, vulnerability. And it really deepened during the Great Depression when very, very low jute prices meant that most peasants sold off all of their assets. And in 1943 and 1942 and 1943, when rice prices rose very sharply and jute prices did not rise as much, it led to great hunger. It led to the Great Bengal Famine, where between two and three million people died of starvation, most of them in East Bengal's jute tracts. So this is sort of the broad history of jute's economy during the colonial period, a late 19th century period of relative prosperity when jute brings in cash earnings um, and their household subsistence is not compromised, and an early 20th century of scarcity, of risk, of vulnerability, of hunger, of starvation, and of death. So the period, the early 20th century period, the late, sorry, the late 19th century period, right up to World War I, was a period of relative prosperity. And this prosperity in the Bengal's jute tracts marked itself, revealed itself in jute cultivators' material possessions. And this, to me, is one of the most important, I think, points I make in the book, which is I focus on peasant consumerism. And the peasants are always seen as producers, as people who produce rice, produce jute. We never think of them as buyers. We never think of them as people who consume goods. And the argument I make here is that we should not see the expansion of jute cultivation as merely a sort of a, a peasant response to the uh, incentive of price. It's not the cold calculus of profits and prices. Rather, it is about the hot desire for consumer goods and new kinds of consumer goods that have become available for the first time in rural huts and bazaars and melas. Um, there's lots of anecdotal and uh, sort of numerical evidence that shows that peasants were consuming Manchester cloths corrugated iron roofs, umbrellas, kerosene oil and lamps, safety matches to light those kerosene oil, cigarettes, metal utensils, silver and gold ornaments, umbrellas, children's toys, legal services, educational facilities. These are new goods that were not available any, at any point before in rural huts and bazaars, and suddenly we see them available 
And the way to buy them is to grow jute, to earn cash to buy them, and they're buying more and more of them. There are two points I want to make, and I do make, about peasant consumption. First, that the consumption of these commodities did not lead peasant men and women to adopt forms of dress, of living, of domesticity, of dining, of sociality, that we would think as modern. In other parts of the world, in urban areas, new forms of clothes, new forms of homes, new form of construction materials meant there were changes in people's livings that made them recognizably modern. Not so with the peasantry. In peasant men still wore lungis and gamchas. They did not start wearing trousers and shirts, unlike urban men. Peasant women did not start wearing blouses and petticoats, unlike urban women. Peasant families did not start sitting on dining tables upright and eating off of tables, unlike urban families. In spite of corrugated iron re replacing thatch on peasant roofs, peasant home remained single room, multi-purpose structures constructed around a central courtyard, rather than multi-room constructions with specialized spaces for different activities, different room for dining, different room for sleeping, and so forth. All of this meant that for uh, colonial observers, for colonial officials, for urban podrolok who saw the peasant, they did not see them as modern. And so it was a paradox in the way in which peasants were viewed. They were both pros prosperous and backward because their prosperity had not resulted in what, was, what other people recognized as modern. The second point I want to make was that, is that consumption was hugely significant to peasant households themselves. The various forms of consumption that they were doing was politically significant. What I do in my book is I reinterpret the Shodeshi movement and the Shodeshi clashes between um, peasants and activists. So just to give you a little bit of background, the Shodeshi movement in 1905 was one of the first organized nationalist movements. And it em, em entered the rural countryside as an attempt by activists to forcibly prevent the consumption of imported consumer goods. They would go into huts and bazaars in rural areas and prevent vendors from selling cloth, from selling imported salt, from selling various kinds of consumer goods. And in the course of this, you would have various moments when the activists and peasants would clash. There would, there would be violent clashes. What I do in my book, they say, and most historians have seen these clashes as, as Hindu-Muslim. They're Hindu-Muslim violence, and that's how it's been interpreted in much of history. What I do in my book is I say, no, actually, we should not see this as Hindu-Muslim clashes. We should see these clashes as attempts by peasants to protect the practices of consumption, to protect their market-based livelihoods, to continue to enjoy the pleasures of consumption in marketplaces, against an attack by nationalist activists that are attempting to prevent that. So one of, the, one of my cases is, uh, is, a, is a clash that took place in the Nangalban Mela in, outside Narayanganj. And the clash begins when um, Shodishi activists enter the Mela and they force one boy who had bought a German-made looking glass to return it, and they force another boy who had bought a small box which said made in Germany on top of it to return it. And the people got so upset that they attacked the Shodeshi activists. And I, and I read that event and other similar events to say what is happening here is not just Hindus and Muslims going at each other. It is a place where consumption is pleasurable and someone's trying to stop that pleasure of consumption and an attempt to protect those practices of consumption. So these pleasurable forms of consumption, of course, all end with World War I. We enter the period of uh, immiseration after World War I, and consumption becomes a much more stressful activity. Marketplaces are no longer sources, places where you can have fun. The places, they're stressful places where you're struggling to secure basic subsistence. And this is, I'm gonna move to a different, another point I make in my book here, where I move forward to the 1930s, and I say, instead of this politics of pleasurable consumption, we get new discourses which promote, um, amongst peasants, which promote austerity, which promote hard work, which encourage cutting down on consumption, um, which criticize consumption as frivolous, and which relates all of it to Islam. So my book examines how the consumption and pleasures of consumption give way to new discourses, criticizing consumption as frivolous and wasteful, and emphasizing careful household budgeting, austerity, hard work, 
and even patriarchal authority over men, over, over women and children as a means of balancing household budgets. Moreover, these practices are construed as Islamic. This discourse of being austere circulates in the form of texts. These are uh, little pamphlets that are published in small town printing presses in Kishorgonj, in Babna, in Tangail, which are putis. They're putis that have been printed out. And there are these long poems. And they're oftentimes the text itself is adorned with Islamic symbols. You have a crescent moon and star on it. You'll have an Arabic word in the title. Some of them open from the right, like an Arabic book. And I argue in the book that these texts constitute an agrarian form of Islam, a new thinking of what Islam should be in a peasant community at a time of immiseration and poverty. The poems often begin with a few lines decrying Muslim peasant poverty. Musulman gone aaj dekhiya hai hai bukta jai fatia. Poets critique frivolous consumption. Behuda khoro jeba kurilo shaitaner bhai she huilo. And they relentlessly mock peasants for, the, for, for their consumption. And they're particularly mocking of something called an Albert cut. An Albert cut was apparently a fashionable hairstyle in the 1920s, named for Prince Albert, uh, consort and husband of Queen Victoria. So the poem goes, Mathai Albert rakha kamun baka malir chat. Albert toile dite dite toilor pollo bat. The poems actually are, and I read this in my book, as a program of Muslim emancipation. They call it mukti. How do we liberate Muslims from poverty? How do we liber emancipate Muslims from their economic conditions? Um, this program for emancipation is perhaps made most explicit in a pamphlet by a man called Abdul Hai, um, written by a man called Abdul Hai called Adur Shukrishok, which was published in Maiman Singh in 1921. Adur Shukrishok included a 21 pro point program for Mukti. The first point was every peasant will keep accounts of revenue and expenditure and will completely desist from all wasteful expenditure. And then it went on. Farmers should keep enough land to grow rice for subsistence. They should plant cotton, sugarcane, date palms, beetle vines, and tobacco. They should not visit markets empty-handed, but with goods to sell. They should avoid litigation. They should bu not buy fish, but catch their own fish. They should not smoke tobacco or chew beetle leaf or chew pan unless they've grown it themselves. They should make their own umbrellas instead of buying umbrellas, so forth, so forth. Islam in 1920s and 30s Bengal became, oddly enough, a program of austerity, a religion of austerity. It was about buying less, working hard to produce your own goods instead of buying it from markets, not spending too much. Um, I haven't given those quotes. It was also about disciplining your women and children harshly instead of rewarding them by buying them goods. Um, and it was this very kind of austere, very harsh idea of austerity. Which, which, which informed this new practice of Islam. The th I want to conclude with just by making one of the other big themes of the book, um, which is about spaces of capital um, and how Jude sort of makes the geography, the spatial landscape of the region as we know it. One of the interesting things about these pamphlets, of course, is they're all published in these small towns, right? They're all published in Mufassal small town printing presses. And I think you can trace the growth of the printing press, the Mufassal print culture, Mufassal print economy from Jews. And particularly the relationship that Jude carved out, wrought between small hinterland farms, small towns where Jude was collected processed, bailed, assorted, and Calcutta. So Paul, what I do in my book is I show how peasant-produced jute moves through the deltas, riverways, and railways to Calcutta's warehouses, dockets, and mills, and how along the way the fiber is bulked, assorted, and packaged into standardized bales. And then I show how in these towns where these activities take place, these towns grow very rapidly. These towns grow very, very rapidly during the late 19th century as merchants move in. And as is the always case in the British Empire, state follows very closely on the heels of capital. So merchants are immediately followed by officials, various kinds of 
government services and so forth. Um, by these towns, the big towns, the big Jute towns are Narayangan, Shirajganj, and Jadpur. But all other Jute towns, which are very important Jute centers, include Akhaura, Brahmanbaria, Krishorganj, Tangail, Jamalpur, Madaripur, Faridpur, Bogra, Pabna, Nilfamari, Domar, all the little towns that we know today are very much connected to the Jute trade. During the late 19th century, these towns are very much um, were, were largely Hindu, mostly Marwari merchants and Bengali Hindu salaried professionals. And they would appear as um, little islands of, little sort of islands of Hindu dominated spaces surrounded by, a, in a sea of mostly Muslim peasant, peasantry. And uh, Shodashi conflicts really brought that sort of dynamic to the fore. Um, uh, during clashes at the John Mashtumi Mala in Jamalpur, there was actually episodes of Muslim peasants laying siege to Jamalpur town, surrounding it. Um, and they've got this real sort of town country dynamic going there. But the composition of these towns began to change after World War I, um, or even earlier than that in the 1900s, when Muslim peasants began to invest jute money in sons' education or in setting up businesses in Mufassal towns. These mostly Hindu towns by the 1930s had become half and half largely, half Hindu and half Muslim. And these newly created new class of mostly Mus Muslim uh, professionals, Muslim businessmen who were moving into Mufassal towns with close roots to the countryside um, formed the sort of, the, the, they, were, they were the ones who were establishing printing presses, authoring poems and pamphlets, financing the printing of poems and pamphlets. They were the, this Mufassal Muslim middle class of businessmen, salaried men, constituted the circles of authorship, patronage, and readership that produced and consumed agrarian Islamic texts. Those printed poems that were coming out of this new group that had come out and emerged in the 1920s and 1930s. My book places, especially in the latter half of my book, I place a strong emphasis on this newly created Mufassal Muslim middle class with roots and strong connections to rural hinterland. And I talk about how they sort of transformed the processes of formal electoral politics in the Bengal Delta during the last decades of the British Empire, and then played crucial roles in the Pakistan movement during the closing years of British rule. My book ends in the immediate aftermath of partition and uh, with, the, with the creation of East Pakistan. And what I'm really focused on in that chapter is partition. Um, if, you, you know, if you think about it, partition effectively carved out the jute lands, took it away from Calcutta, and made it its own country. It created an East Pakistan that was, a, that was a hinterland without a metropolis. There was no industry, no large cities, nothing. For the post-colonial state of Pakistan, the immediate concern was to generate revenue from fiber, to earn taxes and foreign exchange from exports of jute. The problem for the Pakistani state, however, was that most jute just went across the border, across partition lines to the other side. In my book, I show how jute was the first commodity to be policed across partition lines, the first commodity to be regulated. The first attempts to like stop things moving across the border was not people, but fiber. And the Pakistan government's attempt to capture it and generate revenue. And I show how the Pakistan's attempts, Pakistani government's attempts to really make fiber, to police fiber led to more and more ridiculous, more and more violent interventions in the borderlands, culminating in 1952, when the government called in the military to prevent smuggling on the border, gave it shoot to kill orders. If they catch someone smuggling, they could just shoot them. And in typical military fashion, called it Operation Close Door. Um, and it sort of, the book ends there. Um, but let me just read from the conclusion to, to show you where it really ends. It ends, but it ends like chronologically at that point. Excuse, sorry, I'll just be quick. So this, this is from the conclusion, which is really, really rather brief. While conducting archival research in Bangladesh, I was often asked by friends and family, whether family members, whether my research would help in reviving the jute industry, if I would bring jute back. This desire to bring jute back is an oft-repeated slogan for politicians, academics, policymakers, and newspaper editorialists in Bangladesh. 
Newspapers run headlines, run editorials headline, revival of golden fiber, or lost glory of jute needs to be revived. And the Bangladeshi state sponsors initiatives promoting jute handicrafts, demote and decoding the jute genome, and policies mandating the use of jute bags for packaging. To return to this, this, to return to this question that was posed to me repeatedly, no, this book is not intended to help revive the jute industry. Instead, my ambition is to provide a language to describe local histories of global capital as they exist, not as they're imagined by nationalist projects. To the new jute nostalgists of contemporary Bangladesh, I would suggest a deeper engagement with the economic lives of today, with the economic lives of garment workers and overseas laborers who constitute today's contemporary Bangladesh's local history of global capital. Thank you.